really great products like Lur Lucas Learning Games that actually nets on project-based learning for kids that kids loved, that parents tolerated, and educators were adopting. Like I just never thought that was going to happen. And then Minecraft happened. I was like, what? The most popular game of all time is like awesome. Um, so it's crazy that this happened and you know it's been lovely to connect with folks on um, you know this panel really represents the mix of stakeholders that are involved in making uh, Minecraft a force for good and learning um, including folks from uh, the Minecraft and Microsoft teams uh, educators uh, researchers uh, and uh, you know I think we're really lucky to have a good mix of voices and uh, what I'm going to do is I'll let everybody introduce the world environment into their classrooms. Um, so I sat down with the Mojang Game Studio, which is a studio that created Minecraft um, about three and a half years ago in Stockholm. And I said, hey, I hear you're interested in doing something with education. I'm from Microsoft. I'm here to help. What's your vision? And they said, our vision is to change the world. And I, I, I will admit, I paused for a second. I thought, wow, that sounds maybe a little bit naive, but also really big. But I, I said, tell me more about that. And they said, the next generation of world leaders are growing up playing video games. And, and people are learning about rules of society and consequences through these multiplayer games. And we think Minecraft's a great place to do that. And I will say, from, from that day and every day since, I have felt incredibly inspired by that mission and that opportunity. Um, and so we started about three and a half years ago in classrooms, meeting with educators, meeting with researchers, um, inspired by my Mimi's Connected Learning work, by uh, Jim G's work, Jane McGonigal's work, and thinking about how can we really cultivate what happens very naturally within Minecraft, which is um, curiosity to explore, self-directed learning, intrinsic motivation to go um, and create and collaborate with others. How can we protect what, what is naturally in this consumer game and connect that with um, learning spaces? And so started to, to create a team um, working very closely with educators on um, doing just that, on bringing it into classrooms, on connecting it with where students are when they come into today's classrooms, where they're, they're playing games, they have access to technology, um, they're curious, uh, and then connecting that with the demands on our educators, so finding a way to introduce it in a way that's not, not too overwhelming. Um, have been really fortunate to work with a lot of uh, folks on this panel um, and continue to build that out. So about a year and a half ago, we launched Minecraft Education Edition, um, which is a, a version of Minecraft specifically designed for schools. Um, we did very little to change the game, but a few of the things we did was to recognize how schools purchase and license software um, and some of the security and privacy requirements that schools have around the world. We also did put a few features in the game based on what we heard from um, interviews and, and, and watching how teachers were using Minecraft in the classroom. One element was they said, when I'm in the classroom with my students, I see the learning that's happening, but I don't have a good way to capture that. So we put a camera in the game. We put, it looks like a, an old school camera and it captures a Polaroid, and that allows the students to capture and document their learning. They can put notes on it, so if they're studying um, middle Ages and they've built a castle, they can put some context around that, maybe what year that was or what materials that you've used, um, and that becomes part of their learning portfolio. Um, so I've, I, I spent probably that first year waking up every day thinking, I hope today is not the day I ruin Minecraft, either for that community of players or for the educators who are early adopters, incredibly passionate, and more importantly for our players. Um, and it's, um, we've gotten through that, I think, and have really um, had a warm reception from educators. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Dervazi, and I'm a Toronto-based high school English and media studies teacher. Uh, I'm also a doctoral candidate at York University, and my work tends to look at the various intersections of games, society, learning, culture. Um, I, I have used uh, a variety of commercial games in instructional settings uh, for a very long time. I help teachers also integrate a variety of game-based learning initiatives into their practice, and I design what are called pervasive games or, or large alternate reality games uh, to run classrooms in a, in a very different way that, that substantially alter the systems that play in the classroom. And one of the games that has been sort of within my repertoire for a while, but not, not a significant one, just you know, sort of part of what I do with other teachers and what I've done in my own practice has been Minecraft. Um, so I'm going to share uh, a few examples of the types of things that we're doing with Minecraft at the classroom level, something that's part of a larger project that, that I did with my students. Um, and I look forward to participating in this panel. 
Hi everyone, my name is Minu. Uh, I also work on the Minecraft Education Edition team. Uh, prior to coming to Microsoft and Minecraft, uh, I taught my students high school English for 10 years in the school district of Philadelphia. Uh, I grew up as a teacher in the National Writing Project and applied and tried to apply a lot of the connected learning principles in my own practice as an educator. Um, and now on the team, I think a lot about how do we help uh, teachers adopt this incredibly powerful tool uh, for learning, where students are driving their learning, where they're um, uh, driving their own inquiries, they're solving their own questions. Um, and I also work on our community as well. Hi, folks. I'm Sean Dickers. And first, I want to say, Deidre, thanks for not wrecking Minecraft. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. Yet, yet, you know, we want to uh, keep it up, keep no up pressure. the good work. So I, I was a former middle school teacher. And those, those people that are here that are teachers, uh, I've found uh, as a researcher um, and moving into that world that one of the most interesting things are these innovative teachers around the country and around the world, even in Australia, that are doing amazing things. And they're reinventing how to do classroom and what that kind of learning environment looks like. So I spent a lot of my time talking to these teachers and finding out what they're doing and looking for common threads between dispositions, classroom organization, assessment, and how to make those things work in the classroom. And that has just been a direction that I've taken. And surprisingly, around eight, nine years ago, these Minecraft using teachers started to pop up. And started to swear by this new tool, and so I had to dig into it. My first response was to go home and bring it to my kids and say, look at this new thing and, and tell me what you think about it. And they came back within a day and said, Dad, this is, this is totally new, and this is totally different. And it comes from that generative space where you get to build things, anything you want in a world, and that makes it really usable by teachers and, and something you can dig into. So we'll talk more about that as we go, I'm sure. sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's uh, Michael Dejuani. I'm a uh, an associate professor um, in the Digital Media Research Centre um, at QUT in Brisbane, Australia. Um, and um, I started um, doing research around Minecraft about six years ago uh, in both uh, classroom settings and um, in family home uh, settings. And I guess um, one of the things that I've been uh, mostly trying to work out over that period of time is how we can really um, construct a a theory, I suppose, a theory of learning uh, that takes account of uh, the, the ways in which people learn in very, very diverse ways across both formal and informal environments and, uh, you know, what kinds of theoretical tools we might use to, to do that. And, you know, I think that's really important because I think if, um, if Minecraft isn't going to uh, change and, you know, um, education is going to change instead, to make way for Minecraft, then we need to really understand or really need to be able, uh, we need to be able to defend that in a robust way. And the only way to do that, um, from my perspective as a researcher, is to you know, really understand the theory around it. So I'd like to say a few words about that during the panel at some stage. Thanks. Great, so uh, yeah, I think the way we're gonna structure is I'll ask a few questions for the panelists to respond to sort of starting with some of the challenges and then um, thinking about the more promising uh, solutions. So we'll start from a dark place, but we'll get somewhere good eventually. Uh, so I'm gonna start with Deidre. Uh, so I think what's unique about the trajectory of Minecraft um, in terms of like an education title is that it started off as chocolate, not as broccoli. So mm -hmm. it's almost like broccoli covered chocolate was your job. Mm -hmm. And it's great that you didn't ruin it in the process, but I know that you've had some really unique challenges because uh, you know there's a really wide range of educators, and um, you know having uh, to harness the power of you know kid initiative within the classroom context and teachers' constraints is not a simple task. No, and I, I'll add to that too. We started from. Um, taking what was an incredibly or what is an incredibly popular consumer game mm -hmm. and um, wanting to stay true to our principles of the game. And so we were very um, thoughtful working with the original Minecraft game designers on um, what would be appropriate to put in place. And so there are some things that educators ask for when we, when we ask them, what do you want, or when we observe them, things like having smaller environments and not an open world. An open world in a 40 minute class period feels really overwhelming, um, but we resisted that. There was also a request to be able to freeze students and 
working with our game designers, they said that that takes away from the empowerment that people feel when they're playing Minecraft. And so we resisted that too. And so trying to find that balance between maintaining um, the elements of the game that actually invite the exploration, um, but still providing appropriate classroom management for educators is something we really struggled with probably for a good six months, and we iterated that on a, a lot. And so um, we found places where we could do things that were within um, the, the game design principles and that our, our game designers were comfortable with. Like we put in a classroom management console where educators could um, change settings in the game. They could view all of their students uh, top down on a map. They could move students around on the map. But there would be notifications. So there was more autonomy for the students, and they felt more empowered. They didn't have that feeling of being in a closed down world. Um, so that was a, a lot of the early trade-offs was protecting the, the core principles of the game um, from doing things that we felt like would make it easier as a teaching tool. And that was, that was really fundamentally important and a lot of tough conversations, a lot of back and forth on that. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Do you still, um, did you get kind of pushback on either side? I mean, I guess it's harder to know how the kids are responding to like, there, you know, when I remember in the early years of social media and blogging was taking off, you know, we had this great idea that we would be, bring blogging into the classroom because mm -hmm. it would make things so much fun. And then our students were like, what? That's like blogging with my mom. Hmm. And there was sort of this sense that, you know, it was like maybe more fun than not doing something fun, but it wasn't as fun as the real fun. I mean, do you get pushback from either the kids' side or maybe from the teacher's side that it's still too wild for them to really adopt? I think uh, initial reaction from educators is often anxiety when we run um, workshops at events mm -hmm. like at the ISTE event. Um, there's just the level of anxiety of people waiting outside that classroom. These are people who have said, I'm going to go do this session. They, they lined up for it. And then they come in and they sit down in front of a computer and they look and there's a video game. And you can feel the tension in the room. But but what I've seen, and I, I'm sure all of you could um, share your own experience, is that as soon as they get in and they have some little victory, and it may be, for those of you who played Minecraft, mm -hmm. just learning how to jump, learning how to walk forward and navigate, those little victories start to build confidence. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. you know, an educator in the first 10, 15 minutes really can start to feel comfortable in the environment um, start to have these little these little rewards these little celebrations um, up until they're like oh my gosh there's a sheep can I kill it I don't know where that comes from but uh, so I found that that educators pretty quickly are able to get comfortable with what mm -hmm. is a brand new foreign environment um, on the other side every kid in their class knows more about it than they do and for the kids that's really empowering and so yeah that's interesting they, yeah. even where there are some trade-offs between the game that they're playing at home versus at school um, they know about those and so there's a certain amount of pride in being able to explain that oh well, this is different in the education edition or this doesn't exist in this one yeah you know you've been working with teachers on oh, this yeah. so, I, so. Um, I was just going to add that the tension and the anxiety that educators face actually then transforms into a learning and a transformation moment for them when they find a mentor or when they find a peer who can be like, okay, it's not that hard. Like if you teach reading to students, you can surely figure out how to walk in Minecraft. Like you got this. And that, uh, that overcoming and that sense of accomplishment pushes them to explore further. And I think in all uh, pedagogy practices that are st where the students are at the center, there is always that tension of how much am I as an educator in control and how much should I step back and let my students drive their decisions and their experiences about what they want to learn, how they want to learn. And I think that evolution of that teacher practice is not only incredible to to uh, to witness, but it's also really empowering and, and the community that's building uh, around existing educators in the Minecraft community and how they're bringing more educators newer to the experience into the community is just as incredible to witness. Yeah, Sean, you've talked to a lot of different teachers um, and even written a book about this. Uh, yeah. I'm curious, well, Minu or um, Michael, too, if you know, you've seen any examples of, like, we know the amazing, like, Minecraft educators who, you know, are just doing this unbelievable project-based learning, but have you found 
Well, both like what are the challenges and how many of those teachers actually are there versus like teachers who are either, you know, maybe struggling to get into it to begin with. Like I have to confess, I find Minecraft really hard. Like I just find it mechanically very difficult. My brain doesn't work in 3D like that. So everything from like simple physical limitations to, you know, you know, teachers who maybe, um, you know, like Deidre was saying, the impulse was that I want to be able to free, like, assume classroom discipline. And like, have you seen pitfalls or like problematic kinds of um, uses? You don't have to name names, but I'm I just won't curious. Name names. <laughs> so, well, and in the, the book is Teacher Craft, and yeah. really, when I talk to teachers, well, there's a few things. One, a lot of them come back and say, "All I needed was Chapter Seven, <laughs> like, and Chapter Seven is the the chapter that says, "Here's 40 ideas." Uh -huh. in different classrooms, different subject areas, different grade levels, and here's what people are doing. And oftentimes teachers can appropriate what other teachers are doing easier than inventing their own thing. Mm -hmm. So if I can um, find out what Paul's doing in his classroom, I can take my favorite novel and build a role-playing game around that. But it's mm -hmm. the idea that's the powerful part. With Minecraft, there's this interesting thing, and I'm wondering if you see this in yours, we almost always with teachers, even from the thing where you're teaching them WAST and the space bar is jump, and once they master that, that the next conversation isn't about mechanics, it's about values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What am I doing with my classroom? Absolutely. What mm -hmm. kind of experiences do I want my students to have? And that's a real challenge for teachers that have been traditionally trained, where really the value is teach those standards, mm -hmm. topic, topical style standards. Where with a lot of these maverick or early adopting teachers, they've gotten to the point where they're not as worried about the standards as they are about the character of the student that they're training and the kinds of students we want to train, which I think becomes even more relevant when we start to see lost kids in this generation that don't have vision, don't have direction, mm -hmm. because they haven't spent time in spaces where they get to make decisions and choose directions. So, and then the other, I, I would say another roadblock is navigating those values grounds to the point where you say, okay, so I have my students doing things in a creative space, how do I bring some sort of value or a, how do I bring that into my grade book? Yeah. And the snapshots are a good start, but that's almost, it's an ongoing part of that values discussion of how do we assess, mm -hmm. how do we make meaning of it? I, you know, even going back to the pushback from teachers, should we assess? Mm -hmm. Or when we assess, do we destroy the activity itself? Mm -hmm. And it's, that's a valid question. So, because we're then colonizing the space and trying to make meaning out of it that maybe the space doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And there's a value to play that in, in itself is worthy of our time. So, um, two, uh, two related comments to that. I think the assessment piece is an ongoing like search for the holy grail no matter what you're using. So when I taught my students whether we were blogging together or creating podcasts or a teen magazine or short documentaries, it was always difficult to assess those pieces that were not a five paragraph essay. So I think that that, it, that will always be the ongoing um, pain point and exploration for educators. And I actually wanna call out Joe Dillon. This is not a shaming practice. Uh, it's actually a shout out to Joe. He just gave me uh, a thing that he used to do with his uh, teachers when he was helping them on board with Minecraft is he would build a grid uh, where teachers uh, would be able to see their students build houses in grid. And once students were done building, they would actually open up the conversation and have a class discussion around the question, did we build a community? And that raised a lot of open-ended conversation about what it means to build a community in Minecraft? Is it that there were usable public spaces in that grid somewhere? Or is it that the three kids who were burning down someone else's house with TNT were not building a community? And, and so I think you make a really good point that the, uh, it's not just important what you do with it or how you teach, but what value uh, transfer are you doing when you introduce any tool in the classroom, but especially Minecraft. Yeah, sort of in, in the broader picture, I'm wondering, we've talked, uh, we've been talking about teachers and what's happening in the classroom, but there's also this broader context, right? And I think some of your comments are alluding to the fact that, you know, there's accountabilities that are bigger than, you know, what the teacher has control over in the classroom. And 
like IT stuff. Like I know you mm -hmm. guys struggled a lot with how you manage accounts mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, just before we wrap up the challenges, I wonder if any of the panelists want to speak to some of the broader constraints of like I know even just purchasing Minecraft licenses is a really kind of gnarly thing to negotiate in a school and I'm I'm curious to hear more about what you've learn your work yeah. yeah so you know starting out we I very much had this like let's let's figure out what works what we need to do and so we started with a relatively um, smaller base of you know how we started to introduce it and we're at a point now where um, the demand is there and people are coming to us and saying I want Minecraft but you don't support my platform and so um, my team is is working every day to understand what those requests are and how we can support them more um, and so we want to, we absolutely want to hear from you, but I would say over the next 12, 24 months that we'll see um, that broadening out, availability broadening out. We've also made an effort to um, connect tools that you maybe are already using. So we're here at MIT, um, Scratch is something we came and met with Mitch and his team and said we would love for Scratch to be integrated with Minecraft for when we do coding. And so we introduced a, about a year ago um, a coding module and you can connect Scratch if you're already using Scratch. If you're using code.org's Code Studio, you can connect that. And so really trying to um, open up that to the community to, to say what, what you're already using. Um, it's still early and I will say we're still figuring it out. Our goal has been like, let's get something out there and get the feedback and see how it's working and then we'll continue to, um, to iterate from there. Anyone else? On the, yeah. uh, well, you know, I mean, I think that um, part of this broader background is the research piece. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really do think that um, we need to continue to try to understand um, what, what's happening, you know, with, with learning um, in relation to Minecraft. And, and so some of, you know, to pick up on, you know, what, what Manu and, and Sean were talking about, um, there, there absolutely is this question about, you know, what gets valued in school, what gets tested in school, and in certain respects, you know, what Minecraft does best, you know, doesn't fit particularly well with that model of, of teaching and learning, right? So um, one of the things I've been playing around with as a research piece is, is to think about um, Basil Bernstein's um, theory of um, pedagogy and symbolic control and this idea that um, um, you can classify knowledge in um, very constrained ways or very openly um, and you can um, control pedagogy in a very constrained way or a very open way as well. And I find that quite a useful sort of framework for thinking about the various things we might do with Minecraft actually because um, if we can locate, uh, you know, activities with Minecraft on a kind of axis around the extent to which that knowledge is sort of really structured or the pedagogy is really structured or not, uh, then that might open up some thinking around, you know, um, how we might move forward or at least, you know, to, to underpin the kind of planning that we might do when we're planning teaching and learning around Minecraft, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think also it might allow us to, um, to, to understand better, you know, how Minecraft can, can challenge traditional pedagogy as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. uh, and, and to reveal some of the, you know, the problems with the system, if you like. And, uh, you know, I do think there are problems with the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that there's not a total alignment with, you know, the learning that we might want to see in the system, and can Minecraft be a Trojan horse, or is it just going to get like, yeah, into the box, or, mm -hmm. you know, something that only privileged kids get to do in the really generative ways? But, yeah, um, yeah pivoting to a more positive note, <laughs> let's just say well, that's a positive, that's uh, I a think positive. Paul's going to talk to us about what a superfood smoothie really looks like in Minecraft. Um, so. so I, I, I want to first uh, build a little bit on what Michael yeah. said. I, I, I'm very, very, very uh, critical of our education system, as I hope most of you are as well. Um, and we, we are working with a deeply flawed, uh, we're working within a deeply flawed system. And one of the things that I find most exciting about uh, the introduction of uh, initiatives like Minecraft in a school, and I like that you said Trojan horse, is because it's exactly that. I think that the viral metaphor is very powerful. and We have this, this kind of belabored institution that has far outlived its usefulness and its value to a certain extent. I'm obviously generalizing. 
And I feel that the introduction of, of this digital dynamic, this, this uh, uh, an expression of the world that we live in as opposed to the world that we're coming from, and it, introducing that into the DNA of our school system um, will start agitating things at a variety of levels. And not just in terms of putting institutional pressures in terms of the uses of time and space, which are the two greatest constraints that are, that are causing problems in our education system, but also changing mentalities, how we think. Uh, a Minecraft kid thinks very differently when he's playing Minecraft than when he's playing a book. Um, and of course, we always value the written word over just about anything else. And, and I think there's, there's val I'm a literature guy, that's what I teach, and I would never undermine the importance of literature. But I also feel that the kind of mindset that a, that a kid adopts when he's playing Minecraft and an adult adopts when they're playing Minecraft um, uh, substantially challenge the kinds of mindsets that have typically characterized our school systems. So what I'm very hopeful of is that these small sort of insertions of grafting these in, into the DNA will start uh, helping people question and rethink not just schools, but the societies that contextualize schools that have left us in this place. So I'm very, I'm, I'm very hopeful that these types of initiatives will actually, you know, one day the historians of, of education will look back at this period and say, this was the turning point, and it started with these sort of small uh, initiatives. Um, so uh, I think uh, one of the things, and, I, and I'm very practical, I'm, I'm a teacher, and, and, and I like practical examples, and I like to share classroom stuff. So as I said in the introduction, one of the things that I do is I design pervasive games. Uh, do you know what pervasive games are? Or? So essentially, I turn my class into a game. And uh, I won about four or five years ago. Uh, I was in my last month of school with my seniors, with my grade 12s, which really is where they fall off the cliff and everything just stops at that point. They stop bathing. They wear sweats. I mean, it's a, it's a nightmare, right? Uh, because they've been accepted into university and they're, 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 they're ready to, to finish with school, with high school. So I had to teach them one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And I had to keep them engaged. And to make a long story short, it occurred to me that uh, Kesey's description of the asylum in the novel, Whoa. that's Ken, that's Ken oh my gosh, saying, that's, that shout that out. Was, um, <laughs> thanks, real. Ken. That was amazing. I have your back. Um, and so when I, when I was going to teach the novel, um, I, it occurred to me that my school, I teach at an all-boys school, it's a nice school, it's a good place to teach was very similar to the asylum that Mr. Kesey was <laughs> describing in his novel, right? I mean, all the behaviorist elements that Kesey was critiquing were very much applicable, not just to my school, but I would argue to most schools. And I thought, how amazing would it be to transfer the asylum world of Ken Kesey's novel into my school? So I ran a 30-day game where I took on the role of a nurse, Nurse Ratchet, and, and I created a whole series of game mechanics that reflected the narrative quality of the book. And for 30 days, they essentially played Cuckoo's Nest at the school. Um, and there's a lot more to be said. It's not really, it's out of the scope of our discussion. But one of the beautiful things that emerged is that the central mechanic of this, uh, this classroom system was, it was all, it was paradoxical in that it was producing a very oppressive regime, and, and there's a lot that I did to create a, an atmosphere of paranoia and a lack of trust between the students during this time. Um, and there was lying and cheating and all kinds of things that were wonderful. And then, uh, but, but um, one of the elements that, that, that was very important to this was a mission system where kids could choose to do whatever they wanted in response to the novel. So one of these things would be that you could choose, for example, fine art, and write the big nurse and say, I need a prescription in fine art. And the big nurse would send you a, a mission of some sort that says, you know, paint this character, or create a sculpture using these pieces of paper in, in regard to this event in the novel. And they can decline it and, get, and ask for something else, or they could actually produce what they're going to do. So it, it, could, we, could we show a slide, please, uh, the first slide? So uh, maybe the one before, there you go. So that's me and my big nurse persona. Um, you can't tell that it's misapplied lipstick and a, and a five o'clock shadow there, which is really creepy. Um, so this is a map of the type of system that we use. So one kid accepts a mission to create a floor plan of the ward as described in the novel. Another kid accepts a mission where he's going to write a song about the main character. Now, remember that nobody knows what anybody else is doing. I mean, the secrecy is the number one law of this game. So everybody's kind of doing their own thing in isolation from anybody else, unless there's certain collaborative elements. They submit these two elements back to the big nurse, and that's it. They get their points. They walk away. They don't realize that anything's ever going to be done with this. Then somebody requests to do something on Minecraft. So the mission is... I'm going to send you a floor plan, 
and I'm going to send you a song. You have to build the floor, the, you know, the, the construct the floor plan in Minecraft and give me a tour of your facilities using the song. So what's essentially happening here is these guys are all collaborating, but not knowing that they're collaborating. The recipient of the floor plan and the recipient of the song don't know that their classmates created the song and the, the floor plan. So this was the floor plan that was submitted to me. He's an amazing student. He's a, this kid's gonna, he's gonna really change the world. Uh, and then this is the, the Minecraft video that I received. And this is the song, by the way, which is absolutely, I didn't even know the kid was musical. Gee, and then he sends me this. I've been away a long time. Yo, it's your boy. Hail to the chief. Brompton, we back. Come on. You know we on the mic. Ha. Cheer. What up? Get him. Alright, let me tell you a little something about this life that I've been living. They call me chief, but no grief. I ain't no... Okay, so we'll stop there. You, you get the picture, but... Um, what an opportunity for collaboration, for creativity. And, and one of the things that, that I just want to emphasize, I mean, the most fundamental, how many of you are teachers? Good, right. What I propose is that teachers start to think differently, that, that, that the mindset changes, that we start thinking of ourselves as designers, as artists, to see the incredible creative potential that's our, at our disposal with all of these tools, as tools, especially things like Minecraft, to start invigorating our practice to make it meaningful to our students. Um, and I know that from pushing into this direction, I have seen the most incredible um, opportunities to stimulate kids who have been deteriorating at the back of the class. I mean, when we do stuff like this, the kids wake up, they become active, and I have, been, I have, I have become very emotional in the past discussing the changes I've seen with certain students when the system itself changes, and I'm hoping that initiatives like Minecraft will start agitating the system in that direction. Great, thanks for that example, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. <laughs> um, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and just share my own passion project in Minecraft, which is on the informal side, uh, to give a little bit of a sense of, you know, some of the variety out there. Uh, we use the consumer version of Minecraft. Deidre and I have talked about this, but like our programs are really uh, more, you know, they're home-based access or after-school uh, seasonal camps. And so it's really important that the identity of the kid travels with them um, across the different Minecraft spaces that they inhabit, which is different from the classroom mm -hmm. edition where I think you made a strategic choice that the accounts are sort of clearly deline delineated as um, school-based accounts. Um, so the way our programs work, we uh, run totally online after school and summer programs in Minecraft where kids do the kinds of things that they pretty much do for fun, like survival mode, building epic builds, uh, you know, bu making mini games, playing mini games. But what we do is we recruit high school and college Minecraft nerds. We train them to work with the younger kids in an intergenerate or a mixed age a uh, community that really replicates the dynamics of really high functioning, uh, out in the wild, youth driven Minecraft servers, but you know, there's um, moderation at all times. Uh, the counselors are uh, you know, challenging the kids, um, are always there to help the kids. So like when you're um, a 10 year old and maybe making your first foray into multiplayer Minecraft, it's pretty intimidating. Again, usually they start with little buddies from school or something on a homegrown server, but going into the open internet, our programs are really like training wheels for being a good citizen in the open internet and the Minecraft world. So we feel like socio emotional learning, digital mm -hmm. citizenship, certain kinds of competencies um, are, are, have to be learned in a real world uh, Minecraft server context, but if you don't want kids to grow up to be griefers and trolls, they also need like the playground monitor and the big brother and big sister who's going to sort of slap them around when they're, you know, being foul mouthed and all these things. And so we're simulating a kind of pro social. Uh, informal learning environment for young people and then along the way pushing them into creating YouTube videos or coding uh, things that they might not do on their own unless it's tied to something that they truly love like Minecraft and we have 
uh, um, you know, a consumer model where the families that can afford Minecraft are home, are paying a subscription and connecting from home. And then we also partner with libraries, with community centers, with schools to do uh, programs within community-based organizations for the kids who wouldn't be able to afford access at home. Uh, and it's been really fun because obviously the little the little kids love, you know, having a big brother, big sister who's helping them, you know, figure out new things in Minecraft. But some of the biggest transformations we've seen are among the teenagers and the young adults who are um, given, being given these connected learning opportunities to give back in something that they feel a genuine passion and affinity towards. And they're often getting their first paid jobs, um, not like working in some random opportunity, but doing something that is really tied to their identity as gaming nerds and Minecraft kids. So it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so I guess I just want to open it up to other panelists too, if there's like heartwarming stories or really great examples of positive practices that you wanted to share before we open it up to the the rest of the community, yeah. Well, um, one of the things I'd like to talk about, one of the things I've become kind of uh, fascinated by recently is the role of um, um, Minecraft Let's Players on YouTube and, you know, how that plays out in terms of an example of kind of connected peer-based learning because, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's clearly something going on here where kids are kind of cycling between playing Minecraft going and watching uh, Let's Play videos, and then going back to Minecraft to try out some of the things that they've learnt from those Let's Players, uh, and then you know, making their own Let's Play videos. So some really quite um, you know, rich and complex things going on there that uh, you know, um, really um, are a, a fantastic story to tell about learning, I think, in lots of ways. So um, that's something I'm investigating at the moment and um, having a lot of fun doing it too. I think that, you know, and we've seen this, I mean, Paul's story, all of our stories have really demonstrated this idea that Minecraft often lends itself to going with other technologies mm -hmm. and with other pieces. Mm -hmm. And it opens up a, a lot of different doors depending on how it gets used, how it gets appropriated, what the grand ideas are to go with it. And some of the charm, the heartwarming stories for me are those teachers that this is their entry point into technology too that it's so good that the students have so much demand for these kinds of experiences, the teachers just, you can start really easy. You just say yes. So when a student says, can I do an extra credit project and I'll do blah, 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 yes, give it a try. And you really don't need a training system. And I know you're doing a lot of work training teachers, <laughs> but you know, I like to think, this is like, were you ever, trained, were you ever trained to use a notepad? Because when you use a notebook, it's, it can do anything. And, and Minecraft works the same way. Once you get past some of the basic digital literacies, which is largely what you're probably spending your time on, it can do anything. Mm -hmm. And for me, those heartwarming stories are teacher after teacher that realize, wow, I never need to touch a keyboard to make valuable use of this in my mm -hmm. classroom. And your story modeled that wonderfully. You didn't touch a keyboard, your students did. did it and it's, mm -hmm. such, it's becoming such a known tool mm -hmm. for students, even at the college level with my pre-service teachers. Their eyes light up when I say, we're about to design classrooms in Minecraft. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, suddenly they're using a tool that they've grown up with because it's been around for so long. Um, and that to me, I mean, those are wonderful moments when you see these teachers realize I have something as valuable as cheap, affordable blank paper that's now available in my classroom. And I can mix that with traditional media, I can mix it with new media and do some really interesting things with it. I just want to add to that from you know, a very practical standpoint. I had been using Minecraft in my classroom for two years before I actually ever entered the Minecraft world myself. Hmm. I did not do it. so the way that I did that this is this is outside of the word game it's something else where we would do Hamlet for example and I would give the students a bunch of different options and how they wanted to respond to the text and one of them is you can create a Minecraft video that reenacts one of the scenes from Hamlet I just give them this I create a rubric around it I don't know how I don't have to know how to play Minecraft I don't have to include it in the classroom and all the Minecraft kids did amazing amazing work because this is what they want to do and they have to synthesize the novel they have to they have to build this three-dimensional space around it and I had I'd never entered Minecraft and I was getting Minecraft assignments over two years so do you ever do the point. thing like at some level part of the wonderful part as a teacher when you want that high level of rigor 
is you simply say, why don't you prove to me that Minecraft's right. worth my time <laughs> in the classroom? Like, you yeah. show me that this has some value. And that's when kids spend all day Saturday invested in Hamlet trying to figure this out because they're trying to prove to you that this is a valuable space yeah. to them. That's awesome. And the longer you can fake like you know nothing, the more you can leverage that. And, and teachers kind of see that, even innovative teachers in Mavericks. Yeah, I've seen uh, so many amazing examples of uh, kids with different learning styles who Minecraft is the place where they communicate. They're really quiet in class. They get in Minecraft and they're owning that chat and driving it. Um, but one of the things I've been thinking about more is we look at a world where access to information is becoming ubiquitous. And we talk about AI. There's so many companies investing in AI. And in that world, we need students who are curious and who are creative and who are collaborative. And Minecraft provides an incredible platform for really encouraging all those skills that are going to be so critical in this this future, this technolog technologically um, dominant future where you know there's there's AI everywhere. It's really having those kids that know how to think about and solve problems, and, and Minecraft provides a, a great playground for doing that. Any questions for the panelists? We can keep chatting about nice examples, but yeah. Well, maybe the mic, just because I think we're live streaming, so, yeah. So something just hit me. I just wanted your feedback about this. Talking about Minecraft, and it reminds me of the way people used to talk about Second Life about mm -hmm. eight years ago. <laughs> oh, no. oh, you can create anything, right? And yeah. then it kind of turned into porn and art. So I'm just wondering, <laughs> like, where do you see <laughs> A parable <laughs> of our times. <laughs> Um, I don't know if anyone wants to. I think there's a big difference, though, between the two. I, I think that there's, um, there was a cultural buy-in to Minecraft that I don't think Second Life ever had, right? So I, I think you have a legion of students who, are just on the, who just want to dig into this game, and I don't think that really happened with Second Life. It was more teachers inviting students into the world as opposed to students pressuring teachers to include them in the world. So I think Minecraft is a much more, I mean, I'm not diminishing the, the incredible things that can mm -hmm. be done with Second Life, but I, I think that Minecraft has greater flexibility, viability in the classroom, and it's actually kind of more grassroots in that it's more the students mm -hmm. that have inspired teachers to, to, to include it in the curriculum as opposed to the other way around. Second Life had a higher learning curve. It had uncontrollable multiplayer. Like we're, with Minecraft, we can control who's in the world together and you can whitelist people. Um, and Second Life, uh, honestly, I like Minecraft's graphics better. I mean, it really just comes down <laughs> to better coding. Um, ease of use, all of, there's a list of things that I think it's a significantly different product. Yeah, and I think what was really interesting for me watching the adoption of Minecraft is, you know, it was released as this indie game that was very kind of small and broken, and then they just kept, like, releasing updates, and it just kept breaking all the time, which was an invitation to the community to fix it and give feedback. So the origins were not, like, shiny commercial game. I mean, now it's a shiny commercial game, and I think when uh, Microsoft purchased Minecraft, there was all this like fear and consternation in the community because, you know, the kids who like my counselors are basically the first Minecraft generation who started with the beta mm -hmm. and were sort of into the whole hackability of the system, and I think the community has grown up with the game, and but there's still like even though like I think. Microsoft is actually fixing a lot of problems with the game and you know doing things like actually creating ways that you can code in the game and things that we really feature sets that we really want we really wanted and were helpful um, you know I think the ecosystem like what Michael's looking at with YouTube and the videos and the opportunities for user generated content and hackability are still essential to the DNA of um, the overall community and that I wasn't I've never been a big Second Life participant but it's very different from most commercial games not just Second Life but most commercial games that are released these days uh, because of that history I think um, yeah Christine. oh yeah we can hear you I'll repeat the question for the live stream Oh, good job. Nice. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I just um, really excited about the um, 
agency that you have in Minecraft. I think it's beautifully designed and a real a potential for a real constructionist space um, to be a real agent in your learning. I also want to really push back a little bit on the role of teachers understanding Minecraft because of like, we know just this idea that open isn't always open, right? Mm -hmm. So open invitations to just play sometimes replicate, you know, the gender dynamics and the, 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 the inequities that we've seen mm -hmm. in games and learning all along. So I wanted to think about like in the story that Minu shared about Joe, what I was also hearing in that story was this idea that um, like teachers had agency to construct um, some conversations around the gameplay and around the construction mm -hmm. and what what are what are the ways that that teachers can be mentors and can be can be um, agents also in this space whether they're playing it or not but to really open up this opportunity for lots of kids for all the kids not just some of the kids who might be interested or have that sort of tendency to gravitate towards these things anyway mm -hmm. so I just wanted to, to see if we could talk a little bit more about that yeah, I think you could do what Paul did for two years where you just receive Minecraft assignments and not jump in. But when you, when an educator embodies the spirit of, uh, I'm going to be a learner too, I'm going to be a learner alongside you, the, the quality of the work produced in that classroom with the guidance of a, of a teacher who takes enough interest not to become a Minecraft expert, but to know enough about it to construct, construct those values, those community norms, those ways of being in Minecraft world together. Um, that's what really inspires me to do the work that I do. So I don't, I, and I, I, I have this debate with my own teammates, like how much do educators need to know in order for them to bring it into their classroom. And I think just enough, I don't think they have to be experts, but just enough. I think just you as an educator taking even an hour and being like, okay, all right, I get it. Okay, I know how to get in. I know what you're doing. I can follow what you're doing is important message to the, the students that, yeah, this is a very, uh, important part of our community, and this is a, a tool that we want to investigate and interrogate together. Um, and I think that's a good point. I'd also like to add a, a few things. First of all, one thing I have learned uh, after teaching for almost 20 years and having done a lot of different stuff is you're never going to get 100% buy-in. No matter how cool, how awesome, there's always going to be a significant slice of the pie, you know, 10 to 15% who are just not into it, who'd rather do something else. Um, so I've always given them an opt-out for something where I feel there might be some, some resistance to it so that they have a chance to do a, a parallel project or something else if they don't want to be part of that. But the, the more important important question that you raise is the one of gender, right? Gender in Minecraft, that's a big question because it is still a boy space in a lot of the ways that it, it's deployed in schools. Uh, particularly the, the after school clubs tend to be dominated by boys. And my, my thesis supervisor specializes exactly in this area and has done studies with Minecraft clubs. Um, and she's, she's found that boys, and this is, I think I was talking to Michael about this it's last working. night, that boys overrepresent their, their ability and girls under are, underestimate their ability in relation to technology, but that's been found the case in Minecraft as well. And when you mix the club with boys and girls, the girls tend to not raise their hand and ask questions, and they defer to the boys as experts. And one thing that my, my, my supervisor really argues for, and I was a little mixed about this at first, but I think I agree with her, is to separate the genders during the, or, you know, the initial incursions into Minecraft so girls can feel empowered in the space, that they're not in some way being intimidated by the presence of boys. And she's found when she's done this, they ask more questions, they feel more confident, and they grow at a level much more quickly than if they are with the boys and then mix them back up again when you've got sort of, you know, that, that equal footing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of curious, I mean, since I do out of school stuff, um, I'm, uh, it's really interesting to hear about the challenges because I, you know, I'm interested in Minecraft, but I really never learned how to play beyond that introductory hour. But what I do is, you know, I just empower um, teenagers mm -hmm. to teach and is there an opportunity I mean I think I don't like I feel like the burden on teachers is really high 
to become Minecraft experts, but there's a lot of talent within mm -hmm. the youth and student body or even online communities. And um, you know, our model was really based on tapping that power because mm -hmm. there is no way that like a uh, parent or teacher is gonna keep up with the latest nerddom in Minecraft. It's just mm -hmm. way too massive uh, knowledge base for I, I anybody can't keep to up. master. <laughs> you can't, you can't? Can yeah, so like I just have like this horde of Minecraft expert teenagers who just spend all of their free time nerding out on Minecraft. And, you know, if there's a way to creatively tap into the um, agency in ways that can be inviting to more kids. So like half our counselors are women. And that has a really important effect, I think, on our community. Mm -hmm. We need to do better on gender, but we're trying, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think we probably need, oh. Okay, one last question, and then we got. I think we one, have to. Cl yeah, it's, yeah. Close this out, Michelle. No, no, come. Um, I wanted to make an offering. Um, perhaps the question isn't about how to get teachers to use Minecraft in the space, but how might we actually honor and cultivate risk taking in learning for teachers? Because yeah. we talk about embracing failure and uncertainty. Um, but the position of a teacher often is to know and to know right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so have we actually held the space in order for to fail in public? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and perhaps if we create the conditions for that, then we can actually leave space to not only use Minecraft, but we can use so many other tools and uh, find things at different intersections. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great note to close on. Thank you so much. Thank you.